Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage, The Vault Series. Today's guest is great singer, songwriter, and musician, Ricky Skaggs. This is part one of a two-part interview. I hope you enjoy it. And if you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Hope you enjoy Ricky Skaggs. Oh boy, I'm telling you. Talk about suffering here below and let's keep following Jesus. Talk about suffering here below and let's keep loving Jesus. The gospel train is coming. Now don't you want to go and leave this world of sorrow and troubles here below? Oh, can't you hear it, Father? Now don't you want to go? And leave this world of sorrow and troubles here below. Uh, my first instrument was a mandolin. My dad bought me a mandolin in a pawn shop when I was uh, five years old. He really wanted a, a mandolin player and tenor singer in the family. Uh, my dad's brother uh, had gotten killed uh, in World War II, and uh, he and dad used to do duets together. Dad played guitar and sang lead, and my uncle played mandolin and sang tenor. And so I think in, in his heart, he always wanted a, you know, uh, someone, a son that, could, that would grow up to play mandolin and sing tenor. And uh, that's what happened. Uh, I learned to sing tenor from listening to my mom. You know, uh, she, was, uh, she was an incredible, great old mountain woman and, and, and sang hard and sang high and, and had sang so soulful, you know, uh, the ancient sounds of the mountains, you know, she sang. And, and uh, it was an incredible um, thing to be around because I, I heard that every day of my life, you know, and heard it at church, you know, when we go to church on Sundays and because uh, everybody sang like that in the mountains, you know. Um, but um, it wasn't really till, till I met Bill Monroe, I guess, uh, uh, I was six years old. We went to Martha, Kentucky, and Bill was uh, going to be there with the Bluegrass Boys, and there was a Bluegrass Girl also that I had never heard of, but that was kind of cool to, to, see, uh, to see that. Uh, and then the neighbors in the hood uh, there in Martha, Kentucky had seen me, you know, playing at church or playing... Uh, at the grocery store, you know, wherever I'd be playing uh, with my dad, and started uh, shouting out to Mr. Monroe to, you know, let Ricky Skaggs get up there and sing a song, you know. And uh, I think after two or three shout outs, uh, he, was, he was willing to go ahead and put a stop to it, and so uh, he let me get up and sing. And um, I played his big F5 Lloyd Lore mandolin that was the size of a guitar to my little six-year-old bony frame at that time. And, um, but I sang a song called Ruby, Are You Mad at Your Man as an Osborne Brothers song, and thank God they all knew it because we started and stopped together, you know. And I love the sound of playing with a big band. It would just been me and Dad at home, you know, and so I'd never really played with a band before. And the feeling of that band, you know, with the bass driving and the, in the you know, the guitar and the, and, the, and, the, and the banjo and the fiddle and everything, I, just, I loved that. And it just, uh, it seared a place in my heart. And, uh, and that night I fell in love with Bill Monroe because he was so nice to me and, uh, and was generous with, with his time. He was a big Grand Ole Opry star and he didn't have to do that, but uh, he took time out of his, uh, his show to, to little, let a little hometown kid get up and, and sing for the, for the neighbors. So uh, what was the progression after that? 
The next big thing that happened to me um, was that I came to Nashville. My dad had always wanted to get me on the Grand Ole Opry. He thought, if I could get on the Opry, if I can get that boy on the Opry, he'll go places, you know. And uh, so anyway, we made friends with Mr. Bell, the backstage guard, uh, at the, down at the old Ryman. The Opry was still there then. And uh, I happened to have my mandolin backstage, and I was standing there playing, you know, and Earl Scruggs walked by and uh, happened to just stop and listen to me play. And, you know, Earl had Randy and Gary by then, I'm sure. And, uh, and uh, so he was pretty sympathetic to young boys playing bluegrass, you know. And so he asked my dad if, uh, if he'd bring me down, you know, for an audition next week for their television show. That's just like a good Martha White biscuit. You can't beat it, I'm telling you. Earl Scruggs, <laughs> what, what do you want, son? Pick. You want a pick? Yeah. <laughs> Earl, yeah. He's drawn back here with his mantle and says he wants to pick. Put him on. Put him on. Take him right over to that uh, mic. It's just down to just about his size. Uh, what are you going to pick? Hog him out in space. Hog him out in space. Yeah. Let's hear it. You can see it now on YouTube. Uh, you know, a seven-year-old uh, little Ricky Skaggs with a vacation Bible school haircut. <laughs> <laughs> just wearing it out, singing Ruby, my big hit, singing Ruby, and uh, and then playing an instrumental uh, with uh, with Lester Neural, and uh, that was a big deal for me. I mean, that was a that was a, a huge thing, you know, to to actually get on television, you know, and um, uh, that was um, I don't know that uh, that made me think that that one of these days, you know, I may have an opportunity to be uh, you know to be an artist. What year was that? It was 1961. Well, after the, uh, the Flat and Scruggs, the television appearance, uh, I met the Stanley brothers back in Kentucky and, and uh, got to meet Carter and Ralph both, and, and they let me get up and sing with them. And uh, so by the time I was nine or 10 years old, I'd already played with the three pillars of bluegrass, Bill Monroe, Flatten Scruggs and the Stanley Brothers. Those three bands are the ones that really solidified the sound of bluegrass, but yet all with their own different textures and, and techniques. Stanley's were much more high lonesome mountain, which was really akin to my heart. Uh, Mr. Monroe was a little more, uh, you know, the hard driving bluegrass, and Flatten Scruggs had a little bit of a country twist to it, you know, uh, with Carter or with uh, with Lester's great singing and the abilities to find really good songs, and, and they did. Um, but I guess it wasn't really until um, I met Keith Whitley. Uh, I was uh, was 15. Uh, me and Keith met at uh, at a little fall carnival type uh, uh, music show in Ezell, Kentucky, and I was there with my dad. And I was playing fiddle at that time, you know, because I started playing fiddle when I was about 13. And so I was there with my dad, and we were playing fiddle, and uh, he was playing guitar and singing a few songs. And, and Keith uh, was there with his brother and uh, Dwight uh, Whitley. And, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know who they were. I just liked his singing. And s somehow we ended up in the boys' locker room downstairs in the basement kind of, you know, area under, underneath the, uh, the gymnasium. And uh, it was just us two. And nobody came in. It was just like the weirdest thing, you know, that we were able to have 30 or 40 minutes by just ourselves just to talk and to sing together and to ask each other teenage questions, you know. Uh, well, who do you like? You know, well, I like the Stanley Brothers. Well, I do too. You know, well, you know this song. And, you know, we just started singing. And, and from that moment on, I knew I had found a brother that I was a soulmate with. Um, and... Um, we, we wanted to start a little band, uh, and actually we kind of did for radio. We had, a, we had a, a band called Ricky Skaggs, Keith Whitley, and the Lonesome Mountain Boys, and it was only my dad and Dwight was the Lonesome Mountain Boys. <laughs> uh, but we had this little radio show uh, in Grayson, Kentucky. On Saturday, we'd do all bluegrass, and then on Sunday, we'd do all gospel, and we'd record those things at Keith's dad's garage. And so those garage tapes are out somewhere, you know, but we did all these, uh, these radio shows for the longest time, uh, and we were still going to, going to high school, but as soon as we got out of high school, that summer even, uh, we went out and started working uh, full-time with Ralph Stanley because we had met him uh, at a beer joint over in uh, West Virginia. Ralph's bus broke down, 
and, uh, and the club owner come up to us and said, hey, did you guys bring your guitar and, and mandolin? Uh, uh, you know, Ralph's going to be about half hour, 40 minutes late. He had a flat tire. And we said, yeah. And so, you know, we got up and sang uh, with my, my dad and, and Dwight. And we got up and sang um, all these Stanley Brothers songs. That's all we knew, you know. And so Ralph come walking in about 30 minutes later, you know, and we were so embarrassed to to see Ralph come walking in and, and he didn't go to the dressing room. He sat right down on a bar stool and I could see him out of the corner of my eye and I would kind of like turn away because I, I was so, uh, so embarrassed for him to hear me singing his parts, you know. I was singing the tenor part, all the, the ones that I'd learned from him. And, and so I felt so, so weird about that, you know. Uh, but when we, when we finished our show, we, we went back. They finally went to the dressing room and we got in there and. And he just went on and on and on. He said, you know, when I pulled in the bus and, 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 and got uh, to walk in here, I thought they were playing the jukebox. I thought they were playing old Stanley, uh, Stanley Brothers songs of me and Carter. He said, you, you, you boys sounded just like, just like us. Well, my God, I mean, we just, we raised about uh, another foot taller, you know, when he said that. He just, just made us feel so, so good. And um, so he asked us back, you know, um, you know, the next month he was going to be there. And then he asked us to join the band, you know, and play with him through the summer. And then uh, when we got out of school, when, when we graduated from high school, then he gave us a full-time job, you know. And it was, uh, it was crazy things like that that was happening. Doors were opening, and they were always opening in, uh, for something. I felt like every time I changed jobs, uh, you know, something went a little bit higher and a little higher. And, uh, you know, I was so so thankful and, and I didn't uh, I didn't even know really what was happening what was going on but uh, I just felt like God was really guiding my steps and giving me a lot of grace to do what I was doing